Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for being here. It's, it's, thanks for inviting me to be here. I sometimes wonder why things are happening at Grand Canyon like they do. And uh, just listening to Allison and Stephen, it just reminds me that things happen because, because of the unbelievable talent that we have around here, both faculty, staff, students. In fact, I was so impressed by Allison's message that I changed my message. And I want to talk about looking and seeing. Um, how many of you are business students? Are there any business students out here? Fantastic. Uh, I want to challenge you today, and yes, I, I did start out as a coach, and I will talk like a coach. I can't help it. I get in front of an audience, and I, I feel like I'm in front of my team, and so if I speak that way, it's because that's been my background, but um, I think it's time that we start, stopped looking at the world or looking around the world or looking through the world, and we start seeing uh, the world the way it really is, and I don't think there's ever been a greater or starker contrast in our world than what exists in America today. And I think we have to start seeing it for what it is and confronting it directly and doing something about it versus talking about it. We just came out of a presidential campaign where we talked a lot about business and Wall Street and problems on Wall Street. We also talked about, a lot about inner cities and poverty. And we live in an incredibly complex time. Uh, those of you that are following business and following Wall Street and where things are going in this country, we've never had a run-up like this. We've never had a time where Wall Street is just exploding. But we've also never had a time where our inner cities were exploding at the same time. And so we live in this world today, in this country today, of these stark contrasts. Now, I will speak from a Christian worldview perspective because that's what I am. I hope this has some application for you, whether you are a Christ follower or not. But I sometimes think that God looks down on this and says, you know, there is stark contrast here that's unacceptable. Uh, and when is somebody going to quit, stop, stop talking about it and start doing something about it? Um, and that's what we're trying to do at Grand Canyon. That's the thing that, is that has become our purpose. Uh, one of the things I've learned in the last eight years is that, Wall Street, or, or that Washington cannot solve the problem of poverty. I was a history major and I taught history for a long time and I remember the 1960s and Lyndon Johnson and he came out with this great plan that he was going to conduct a war on poverty. And he had the best of intentions, but what happened is he created an entitlement system that created a lot of dependency, and poverty's gotten worse, not better. Uh, and our inner cities have gotten worse, not better. And they continue to get worse. Washington cannot, cannot solve the problem of poverty. The problem of poverty starts with business, and it can only be fixed by business. What happens in inner cities? This used to be a middle-class community, in fact, an upper-middle-class community. This used to be a thriving community. If you drive up and down Camelback and Indian School, you will see warehouses and you will see factories that used to employ people that created jobs that created a lot of prosperity here, but you'll see a lot of them today empty. What happens is one company moves out and the tax base erodes, another company moves out, the tax base erodes, another company moves out, the tax base erodes, the momentum starts going in that direction and pretty soon there's not enough money for public schools and parks and golf courses and pools and things that make a, a, a neighborhood worth living in. And so the people that can move out do and the people that have to stay do and what happens? The gangs sense weakness and the gangs move in and they bring prostitution and they bring drugs and they bring gambling and those things that continue to deteriorate a population of people and then you have an inner city. And so how do you turn that around? What I believe I've learned in the last eight years is that Washington can't do it. It cannot be done from there. It can only be done in neighborhoods, but it can be done in neighborhoods. It absolutely can be done in neighborhoods. It requires two things. The first thing that it requires is a catalyst. Somebody has to plant a flag in the ground and say, we're pushing back the other way, this can go the other way. 2010, when we had gone to Wall Street in 2008 to ask for money to go build out a Christian university at 33rd Avenue in Camelback, it was a miracle that we got that out, but we did, and that gave us the capital uh, we, had, we had our first partner, our investors, that gave us the capital to come back and build a university out. By 2010, it became obvious to us that we were going to be able to invest a billion dollars in building a campus. 
uh, we thought that was going to happen. So the big question is, do you do it at 33rd Avenue and Camelback in the midst of all this poverty, or do you go someplace that is cleaner and more washed? Do you go to Scottsdale or Paradise Valley or Gilbert or any of those places? It was that decision that formed the purpose of Grand Canyon. Somebody had to say, we're going to be the catalyst. We're going to plant our flag here, for better or worse, and we're going to start pushing back the other way. And that's what's happened, and God has blessed us in unbelievable ways. We are now a, a $3 billion market cap company. We have 80,000 plus students, 18,000 on the campus, and we have 65,000 students studying online. Uh, Elliot Pollack just finished an economic impact study that says we're worth $1.1 billion annually to the Arizona um, uh, economy, and a lot of that is because we have um, now 9,500 employees. We've become a major employer right here at 33rd Avenue and Camelback. We have 3,800 full-time, 3,100 part-time, 2,500 student workers. That is bringing a lot of wealth, a lot of money, a lot of prosperity to this neighborhood. And so what we could have done at that point is draw a wall around a neighborhood and say, let's just make it safe here and let the government deal with the world that's outside of us. But you see, the government's been trying for decades and they can't do anything about it. And so step two, in addition to building this business and causing it to prosper, bringing wealth and money and prosperity to this place, the second thing we needed to do is keep that going because ultimately nothing changes without jobs. We've created 9,500 jobs here, but we have to keep creating them. And so we have formed a partnership with some of our graduates, and we're going to keep doing that. Uh, the idea is to look at every piece of property or asset that exists on the west side and say, if we invest in that asset, can it become a thriving business that will employ people? Uh, and so that's why we redeveloped the golf course. That's why we developed the hotel. That's why we have two restaurants. That's why we have a coffee company. In the next six months, we're going to have a Canyon Exchange Company, a Canyon Promotions Company, and a Canyon Advertising Company. We're going to hire our recent graduates, let them interview, hire them, give them the capital, uh, give them an advisory board, and tell them to build that business, but then hire people in the neighborhood, because nothing permanently changes without jobs. But because of the 9,500 jobs we have here, because of the additional jobs that we'll continue to create as we invest in businesses and assets on the west side that are worthy of investment that can bring prosperity through jobs, uh, this is going to be a much more desirable place to live. The third thing we had to do is we had to say, you know what, our campus is safe, we have our own police force of 174 policemen and women, but the neighborhood's not. And we can't accept God's blessings without extending them into the neighborhood. So we did sign a million dollar contract with the city of Phoenix police and said, you know what, let's get people out there and let's oversaturate this neighborhood with policemen and let's get the crime out. We've been working on that for four years now. It's not perfect. I understand that. But crime is down 30% year over year in this neighborhood. It's improving rapidly and it's going to continue to improve. The more positive things you bring to a place, the more the bad guys want to move out and go someplace else in our neighborhood. So our neighborhood is getting safer. The fourth thing was that we see uh, all these beautiful buildings, these classrooms, these laboratories, 17 residence halls, 24 restaurants, four pools. It's a beautiful place that God's blessed us with, but the neighborhood wasn't changing. And so uh, we formed another partnership with Habitat for Humanity, and we said, let's, let's sign the biggest contract in, in the history of the, the world with Habitat, uh, and let's raise money through the state tax credit program. Last year, we raised $1.5 million. This year, we're going to raise $1.85 million. Let's set as a goal that we're going to rehab 700 homes in our neighborhood in a five-year time frame. That sounds like a lofty goal, but we've already done 120. Those of you that have helped us with that, thank you very much. Channel 3 just did a study on the entire valley. They released the, the results about 60 days ago, and what they determined was that property values are up in this neighborhood 30% year over year, which is more than any neighborhood in the valley. More than any neighborhood in the valley. Property values are up in this neighborhood. Things are moving. With crime being down 30% and housing values being up 30%, with more than 10,000 jobs being created, this is going to be a desirable place to live. The last thing that we wanted to go at was schools. Uh, people thought that we were going to build a series of Grand Canyon University charter schools, and we said no, but we're very interested in getting behind the public school system in our neighborhood. 
We started a tutoring program four years ago. Uh, we had 20 students involved and some students from Alhambra High School. Uh, to, when we started the school year this year, we have 1,200 students involved providing tutoring and mentoring to 55 different schools um, in the neighborhood. But in order to energize a neighborhood and really get the momentum going, you have to, you have to form real partnerships that create real programs, that create real measurable results. And so when you can go out to the world and you can say crime's down 30%, housing values are up 30%, and then you can say, we've had an incredible success story with a lo local public school. I got to know Alhambra High School principal about four years ago, and I asked him what he was gonna do with his high school because he was new, and he said, well, here's my challenge. I have 2,800 students, 82% are Latino, 90% live below the poverty line. We're a failing school. I listened to him talk for a long time, and I thought, you know, the difference between what you're explaining to me about your school and one in Scottsdale or Port Paradise Valley between 8 o'clock and 3 o'clock, there's not much difference. It's about the same. But between 3 o'clock and 8 o'clock, everything changes in an inner city neighborhood, especially one like this. We don't have welfare in this neighborhood. The, the neighbors are, uh, there's a lot of immigrants. They come from Africa, they come from Central America, and they come from Mexico and many of them are working two jobs at minimum wage, and a lot of them haven't graduated from eighth grade. So our kids in our neighborhood, they don't, they don't get the help between three o'clock and eight o'clock that other kids get. Whatever they learn between eight and three is what they learn, but that's, that's it, they're on their own. The purpose of the learning lounge, the purpose of the 1200 tutors is to give students a chance to get eight or nine or 10 hours a week spent with a college junior or senior that can help them master algebra and give them confidence uh, so that they'll take algebra trigonometry and maybe then even take calculus and start to get a different view of their life, start to get a different vision of their life. And we've had incredible success. Those of you that are students that have helped us with that, thank you very much because the results are unbelievable. We've had a lot of great days at Grand Canyon in my time here, but I will tell you right at the top was uh, last Tuesday. Uh, we went over to Alhambra High School at 8 o'clock because there was a big announcement going to get made. It was an incredibly uh, emotional time. The students were really excited because they had embarked upon a process as a school um, to try to win an award. It's called the uh, Beat the Odds Gold Award. Only seven schools in Arizona have earned that award, and it charts your progress as a school. So 2,800 kids, 82% Latino, 90% live below the poverty line. You know what they did? They won the Beat the Odds Gold Award. Uh, they won it last Tuesday. There's only seven schools that have ever won that award, and they're uh, the only large comprehensive public school that's ever won the award. Their faculty, their staff, and their students deserve so much credit for what they've achieved. Um, they're the ones that, I tell their faculty, you're the ones that go into that school every single day and spend eight or 10 hours with these kids. You are the heroes. But it's hard to do things yourself. And so if we can give a little bit of a hand up, if we can help out between three o'clock and eight o'clock together, we can provide, we can, we can accomplish something that nobody ever thought we could accomplish. Now, we have, we, we've got now uh, a bunch of companies who are wanting to get behind this project. We've raised $700,000, and we've awarded so far 200 full tuition scholarships to kids that go through the learning lounge out of these schools and uh, who attend more than 100 hours in the lounge, get a 3.5 GPA or higher. Our goal is 800 scholarships. I want you to think about 800 kids from this neighborhood who never thought they would get a chance to go to college being on a scholarship to go to a college with 100% graduation rate. If we can make that happen, if we can finish our Habitat program and get 800 homes refurbished and the housing values going up, if we can make the neighborhood safe, if we can keep creating jobs, what will happen here is that an inner city neighborhood will become a, will become a, a uh, middle class neighborhood. There will be prosperity. People will want to live here and it'll become a model for what can happen in every major inner city. We live in an unbelievable country with an unbelievable, powerful economy if we will harness everything that we have available to us and work together, there doesn't need to be inner cities. This is going to be an example of that. My biggest hope for our students 
Uh, I have a lot of hope for our students and for our graduates, but my biggest one is this, that you will be in the middle of this, and thank you for all of you that are helping us do this. But whether you directly participate or not, that you will see it happen. And at 10 years from now, when you've graduated and you've gone out into the world and you've got a fantastic job and career going, you'll get your family in the car and you'll drive back through this neighborhood and say, you know what, I was a student when this happened. I was part of this. I helped at the Phoenix Dream Center, the Phoenix Rescue Mission. I helped with the tutoring and mentoring program. I helped with the Habitat program. I saw firsthand what education should be, which is creative ideas about partnership and, and, and the use of business to eliminate poverty. That's what we should be doing. It can be done. It's being done in this neighborhood. We just need to replicate it. To all the students that uh, participated in this event and put it on, thank you very much. It's an example of uh, what our students do on an everyday basis. For those of you who are out there that are going to employ people, are currently employing people, you want our students first every single time. If you didn't get anything else out of this besides that, you want our students first. Thanks for being here.